Well, good morning, Capshaw. How are you today? First of all, happy Mother's Day to all the moms that are in the house. Thank you so much for who you are and what you do and how you care for all of us as part of your family. I have, uh, I have a special guest with me today. My wife is with me today. How about that? Okay. My wife, Patty, is right down here on row one, two, three. Would you just stand up for one second? I know you're going to kill me later. I know, I know. All right. <laughs> she, uh, uh, we, we have been married, it'll be this year, 47 years. And someone said, how are you guys, have you been successful? I said, well, we've only lived together 25 because with my travel schedule, I've been gone for 22 years. And so uh, when we, we get back, we have a good time. And uh, I'm grateful for her. Uh, the last six months of life, especially since I've been here at Capshaw, has been interesting because we kind of made a pact uh, last year that whenever I would leave on a, a mission or ministry trip, she would leave on a trip to go to the, see the grandchildren uh, who are in two different states. So she's done a lot of traveling uh, the past six months, just as, as I have. Uh, but let me say to you on this last Sunday as I serve as your interim pastor, uh, what a great joy it's been for me. I, I have enjoyed getting to know uh, many of you on an individual basis. I've enjoyed getting to know and to work with this staff who are wonderful people. I've told you this before, but you are blessed with a wonderful ministry staff. Thank God for these people and what they do week by week, and I hope that you're praying for them and lifting them up. And I'm excited about you as you begin now a new journey with the senior pastor. And we pray uh, for Pastor John and his family as they make the transition now from Southern California here uh, to Capshaw and just ask the Lord's blessings on them, especially for their children. Uh, it's tough when teenagers are making transitions at different stages in life. And so we want to remember to pray for them and encourage them all that we, we possibly can. Uh, keep praying for our ministry with Mission of Hope uh, in Haiti. Uh, the Lord continues to do so many wonderful things. And I told you a few weeks ago that we are also taking over now a new ministry or an older ministry called Baptist Haiti Mission. And uh, just found out this, this week, I've got to make a very quick trip to Haiti Tuesday morning to meet with a lot of pastors who are a part of that mission and they're trying to figure out now that we're in charge, how are things going to change? And so there's a little anxiety among them, as you could possibly imagine. So I'm going down to meet with pastors on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And back home on late Thursday night, home Friday and Saturday. And then next Sunday, uh, you know, I've told you also about the golf ministry I'm involved in. So we're doing a tournament in East Tennessee. And I'll be speaking to a lot of unchurched men on Sunday afternoon. And then on Monday morning, back to Haiti uh, for another three days. So uh, a lot of things going on in life right now, and we would appreciate uh, your prayers uh, so very much. Hey, last week we talked about uh, never waste an opportunity to express kindness. And I hope that you did that this week, okay? Uh, I haven't had a chance to really talk to anybody about maybe what your act of kindness was, but if you haven't done it, then do it. And if you did do it and you get a chance to tell me about it later this morning, I'd love to do that. Today, we're going to close that. I thought it would be a good way to close uh, my time with you. We're going to talk about never waste an opportunity to offer encouragement. Now, I'm going to say that in, in two distinct ways. One, to all of us, okay? To people every day, and you'll see that as we get through this message. But secondly, I want to offer this also to you as a church, to encourage your new senior pastor as he comes to lead and to your staff as they are here week by week leading. I want to tell you this one story out of my own past experience. It was in the December of 1981. I was a young pastor uh, at Willowbrook Baptist Church in Huntsville, Alabama. That was my first church out of seminary that I went to pastor. And in December that year, my spiritual father in ministry, Dr. Charles Carter, was having his 10th anniversary at the Shades Mountain Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And I had worked for Dr. Carter as a younger man. And so they asked me to come and be a part of his celebration uh, on that Sunday evening. 
So I preached at Willowbrook two services that morning, and then I tried to put some things together to make use of the day. So I drove to Birmingham to UAB Hospital, where I sat by the bedside of a man in our church by the name of Roland Brown. And Roland was about to go under the knife for bypass surgery. It was not all that common in those days, and certainly not as much as it is today. And Roland had some fear in his life, so we sat together, we talked, we prayed about his uh, surgery. From there, I drove over because it had just happened that weekend, and I met one of my best friends from high school, George Shera. His wife had been shopping on Friday of that week, and a small child had crawled into a fountain at a local shopping mall, and she went in to rescue this child, and in the process, she was electrocuted and died. So here I was. I, drove, I preached twice that morning, drove to Birmingham, saw my friend Roland, prayed with him, uh, talked about the whole issue of fear in our bodies and things like that. At 5 o'clock, I was standing with George in a funeral home with no answers for what had happened in his life and in his family. And then later that evening, uh, I was at Dr. Carter's celebration and speaking and thanking him for the influence he'd been in my life. And then I drove back to Huntsville late that night. And I have to tell you, I was as stretched emotionally as a person could be. I had preached the gospel. I had prayed with a friend. I had stood and grieved with another friend. I had celebrated with another. And it, it gave me that day a good picture of what the rest of my life was going to look like. Your pastor is going to change hats so many times in any given week, sometimes in a given day, that emotional energy is going to be depleted, and he's going to need encouragement. So I want to speak to us this morning on his behalf, on the staff's behalf, but now on your behalf also, because I want us to encourage everybody. Some time ago, I landed on a TV program on Christian television. And I don't watch a lot of Christian television. I'll tell you why in just a second. But I landed on this TV program where a, a ministry that I had been familiar with for a long time, uh, the head of this ministry, national ministry, was taking on another national ministry leader by name who had reportedly called Ministry number one, a false prophet. There were several minutes of outrage and disagreement over theological positions as the two of them, as though the two of them were seated face to face, which they were not. This man kept referring to his theological opponent as though he was certain that the man was watching and hanging on every word. And as soon as he had concluded his verbal barrage, he paused as though to gather himself, and he smiled sweetly into the camera and directed his faithful followers to what the lesson of the night was going to be. Uh, I was reminded of the words of Henry Drummond when he said, How many prodigals are kept out of the kingdom of God by the unlovely characters of those who profess to be inside? How many of those on the outside never make it to the inside? Because in some way, those who represent the kingdom have become such an offense. Now, lest you think I'm picking on these two leaders unfairly, I want to hardly say that there seems to be an epidemic in today's church culture when it comes to criticism and lack of encouragement. I think we're all guilty of it. That's one of the reasons I don't watch Christian television. It brings out the worst in me. <laughs> I mean, the cheese factor is pretty high on some of those programs. And then when I have to sit there with a theological dictionary to figure out what a man said, I just, I, you know, no thanks. Uh, MASH and Andy Griffith's own, I've watched those, and it all makes sense, all right? But we are in that day where criticism and lack of encouragement is rampant, even in the body of Christ. There were monks at a remote monastery uh, deep in the woods who followed a rigid vow of silence. Their vow could only be broken once a year on Christmas by one monk. That year, uh, a monk was going to get to speak one sentence. So on Christmas, Brother Thomas had his turn to speak and said, I love the delightful mashed potatoes we have every year with Christmas roasts. He sat down, silence ensued for 365 days. The next Christmas, Brother Michael got his turn and said, I think the mashed potatoes are lumpy and I truly despise them. And once again, silence ensued for 365 days. 
The following Christmas, Brother Paul rose and said, I'm fed up with the constant bickering in this place. <laughs> Look with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. The scripture says, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, one more time, okay? Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. How do you think that addresses criticism? It, it kind of says, keep your mouth shut, doesn't it? It's just not needed. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. William Barclay says, one of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It is, it's easy to laugh at men's ideals. It's easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It's easy to discourage others. And the world is full of discouragers. We have, he says, a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many a time of word of praise or thanks of appreciation or cheer has kept a man on his feet. Blessed is the man who speaks such a word. Now, that's not only a good exposition from that famous theologian, but if you read Scripture, Scripture gives him his ground of being for that. Proverbs 20, or 15, 23 says, A man finds joy in giving an apt reply. And how good, how good is a timely word. Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Go back in your life and you think in your Christian walk, how many times you were ready to throw in the towel and maybe just give up on faith and someone had that word from the Lord that just spoke to your heart, that spoke to your mind and all of a sudden gave you a renewal of faith and helped you to keep going. Well, this morning, we're going to look at a New Testament model of just that kind of life. And it's found in the life of a man named Barnabas. We call him Mr. Encouragement. We really have very little information about him, but what we do have about him is very re revealing. I'll give you four things about real encouragers. They always, number one, step up to the need. Look at Acts chapter 4, if you would. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. In Acts chapter 2, the scripture says they were all together in one accord and they were taking care of one another as any man had need. Now a need arises in the church there in Jerusalem and the scripture says this man who is called Barnabas, the son of encouragement, he goes and he sells a piece of property that he has he brings it to the, to the apostles and simply places it at their feet. He steps up in a time of need. That's what encouragers do. Do you understand that there are going to be times in the lives of people that you know and that I know where, where they need some encourager to come and speak into their life? There are going to be times in the life of the church where the church is going to need someone to step up in time of need to say the right thing, to do the right thing, and, and really take on this same kind of personality that Barnabas uh, portrays in Scripture. Encouragers always step up to the need, whatever the need may be. Secondly, real encouragers see potential, not problems. Now, look, turn over to Acts chapter 9, if you would. All this is about Barnabas, okay? The scripture says when he, this time is talking about Saul, okay? Saul of Tarsus. Now, what do we know about Saul? Was he a good guy, bad guy? He's a bad guy, yeah. I mean, he was a persecutor of the church. Uh, this was a guy that did some horrible things before his conversion. He has this Damascus Road experience, uh, comes gloriously to Christ, and says when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. 
Now, I'm not going to get down on those guys, but because quite honestly, this would have been like Osama bin Laden showing up, okay? This guy was known as a terrorist. He was persecuting the church. He had killed Christians. And now he shows up and he's telling this story of how he's been converted. Well, everybody's kind of stepping back. And they're watching and they're saying, I'm not sure I'm ready to embrace this guy. But verse 27 says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. I cannot tell you how important that little phrase is in Holy Scripture. Barnabas took him and he brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. And when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Now, how was that church able to experience that? Because a man named Barnabas said, all right, I'm going to take on this brother who everyone else right now is fearful of. He needed someone to believe in him and to believe his story. And Barnabas said, I'll be that guy. I'll put my arm around him. I'll walk with him. I'll disciple him. I'll do whatever God calls on me to do. But I believe in this man. I see not the problems he's caused. I see the potential in him. Now, what if that were the attitude of our hearts towards people who lived in our communities today? We did not see them as the enemies of the cross. We saw them rather as victims of sin. And we began to see them as people of great potential that God could use once they knew Christ as Savior. How important is encouragement? Sister Helen Marissa writes, in an earlier grade, I taped Mark's mouth shut for talking too much in class. Now he was one of my students in junior high math. His class had worked hard all week, and by Friday the students were getting cranky. So for a break, I asked them to write the nicest thing they could about each other and hand it in. I compiled the results for each student, and on Monday I gave out the list. Several years later, Mark was killed in Vietnam, and After the funeral, most of his former classmates gathered with Mark's parents and me for lunch. Mark's father took out a wallet out of his pocket. They found this on Mark when he was killed, he said, and he carefully removed a folded, refolded, and taped piece of paper, the one on which I had listed the good things Mark's classmates had said about him. Charlie smiled sheepishly and said, I keep my list in my desk drawer. Chuck's wife said, Chuck put his in our wedding album. Marilyn said, I have mine too in my diary. And Vicki reached into her purse and brought out her frazzle list. Why? Because that's how important encouragement is to people in life. Third thing about real encouragers, they care more about people than prominence. Look in Acts chapter 11 this time. Scripture says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. And some of them, however, men from Cyprus Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at at, uh, Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and he saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And then Barnabas, he looks at the situation, and he says, I've got to have some help. I've got, to have, I've got to have someone who can just walk with these people through the elementary, uh, elementals of the faith 
and help them to grow and mature. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Real encouragers care more about people than prominence. It would been real easy for Barnabas to say, I, I got this. I'll handle this. Now he said, I need some help. I, I need someone who can jump in here and, and do what's got to be done to help these young believers. Acts 13, 2 says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And Paul and Barnabas were le as leaving the synagogue. The people invited them to speak further about the things on the next Sabbath. Collaboration. That's what an encourager does. He finds other people. He brings them together. He's a uniter, not a divider. And then the last thing I just mentioned to you, real encouragers never quit. This is in Acts chapter 15. It says, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's, oh, by the way, uh, you see now that there's been a change in, in terminology. In fact, I think that uh, if you were to go back to chapter 13 uh, and verse 42, for the first time, you see Paul's name appearing before Barnabas. Barnabas had been the leader up until this point, but now at 1342, it says Paul is named first. So he's kind of, he's the one where the direction is being shifted. By the time you get to 15, it says, sometimes later, Paul, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back, visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. And they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Sicilia and strengthened the churches. Real encouragers never quit, even, even when there is opposition involved. And you know, we don't know all that took place. I mean, sometimes I'm glad the Bible doesn't give us all the details. All we know is that these two wonderful Christian men had such a disagreement about John Mark. He had been a disappointment in earlier ministry. And Paul says, I don't want him traveling with us any longer. And Barnabas said, you know what? I'll take him. I'll go here. You choose another. You go there. Uh, as a kid, I always liked uh, Peanuts. I, I'm talking about the comics now, okay? I still like Peanuts, but... Charles Schultz was a, a great writer, and there were some things in the way he would write that comic strip that would just teach you life lessons. He wrote one where Linus has just written a comic strip of his own, and he wants Lucy's opinion and in the first frame, he, he kind of tentatively hands Lucy his comic strip and says, would you read this and would you tell me if you think it's funny? In the next frame, you see Lucy kind of patting her foot and a little bit of grin comes across her face. She looks at Linus and says, well, who wrote this? And with his chest heaved out and a big grin, he says, I wrote that. In the next frame, you see Lucy wadding it up, throwing it to the side and saying, well, I don't think it's very funny. And in the final frame, you see Linus picking up his comic strip, throwing his blanket over his shoulder, looking at Lucy and saying, Big sisters are the crabgrass in the lawn of life. <laughs> you know, I dare say if you and I thought hard enough, we probably have been the crabgrass in somebody's lawn. Rather than giving them that timely word that they needed to move forward, we probably have been guilty and been more pessimistic than optimistic, more discouraging than encouraging. The disagreement over John Mark caused Paul and Barnabas to form two separate ministry teams and opening up two missionary endeavors instead of one. I don't think that Paul and Barnabas broke fellowship altogether, and I don't think they became bitter because Paul would later speak highly of Barnabas, and eventually, by the time you get to 2 Timothy, which was Paul's last will and testament. He 
he says, pick up Mark and with, bring him with you, for he's useful to me for service. So obviously there had been some healing in that relationship. But that whole story of tracing Barnabas through the book of Acts and tracing Paul's ministry literally across the known world and writing the New Testament, I think it all hinged on this man who said, I'll step up to the plate. I'll do what God's called me to do. I'll put my arm around this brother. And it gives us two very simple truths regarding encouragement. Number one, everybody needs encouragement. Everybody. Is there anybody in the house this morning that could not stand a word of encouragement in your life? Huh? No, we all need encouragement, don't we? Mom and dads, listen very carefully. The scripture says that in your speech, in your tongue, is the power of life and death. Your kids need to hear words of affirmation and love from you. And you check your vocabulary and you check your conversations and you make sure that everything you say is not in a negative spirit of correction. Those kids need to know that you love them, that you believe in them, and that you see the greatness and the potential in their lives. Someone you work with needs a word of encouragement. Someone you socialize with needs a word of encouragement. And the scripture makes it very clear because of Christ living in us, we have been given that ministry both of reconciliation and the ministry of encouragement to other people. You need to be an encourager. Now, can I just say to you on the eve of a new pastor coming to pastor this church? Okay, now this is confessions. I was in one church 33 years. There were some people, when I saw them coming, I was looking for a place to run. Okay, I'm being honest. Because in 33 years, I never heard them speak a kind, encouraging word. There was always something about, we don't like this about our church. In fact, there were some people who disliked so many things, I wondered why they were there. I mean, why, did you, why would you stay in a church like that? Now, this is, this is it's probably my weakness, but I'm just telling you, as a pastor, there were people I would try to avoid because I just didn't think I had the emotional energy left to hear one more negative word coming out of their mouth. Everybody needs encouragement. Number two, all of us can speak words of encouragement. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up just as in fact you are doing. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, We urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Hebrews chapter 10 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. I love it in the New Living Translation. It says, think of ways to encourage one another, outburst of love and good deeds. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now the day of his coming back is drawing near. Listen, if it was drawing near then, it's even closer now. And we need to be speaking words of encouragement to build up the body of Christ. Several years ago, back in, back in the 90s, the NCAA basketball uh, tournament was between Michigan and North Carolina. 11 seconds to go. Michigan is down by two. One of the stars of the game, Chris Weber, grabs the ball, races down court, calls timeout. Problem was, there were no timeouts left. His team was assessed a technical foul, two free throws, and possession of the ball went to North Carolina, and they won the national championship. Chris Weber was devastated. Just devastated. 
He said he received hundreds of letters of encouragement, but one that stood out. Listen to this one very carefully. Dear Chris, I've been thinking of you a lot since I sat glued to the TV watching the championship game. I know there may not be anything I or anyone else can say that will ease the pain of what happened. Still, for whatever it's worth, you and your team were terrific. You can always regret what occurred, but don't let it get you down or take away from the satisfaction of what you've accomplished. I know how you feel because I've had some failures myself. You have a great future. Hang in there. Signed, sincerely, Bill Clinton. Now, you may find fault with Bill Clinton in the way he represented the office of president. You may find fault with his political decisions and his lifestyle choices, but you can't find fault with that kind of letter. Who in your life, in your circle of influence, needs to hear a word of encouragement that comes their way through you? You know that person on your Sunday school class role that hadn't shown up in months? Maybe rather than just saying, hey, where have you been? Maybe just to say an encouraging word to them. Maybe that man or woman that used to sit in, in, the, in the chair next to you on Sunday morning, that they kind of disappeared. Maybe they just need a word of encouragement to come back. Encourage one another while you have the opportunity. Romans 15, 4 says, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. I believe we have the record of the life of Barnabas in the book of Acts to teach us what it means to be an encourager to other people. So here's this week's assignment. Now, some of you have got two assignments because you didn't do the first one, okay? So you got to go express kindness, but you also got to go find someone to encourage this week and just speak that word that will lift them up. Hey, you're a great church. You got a great future. God's providing you a wonderful, new, fresh start in another saga of your journey, of your journey with a new pastor. I pray you'll encourage him. I pray he will never see you and go the other way. <laughs> I pray he won't dread your note. I pray that he will know that you love him and you care for him and that you'll pray for him. And remember, all the while, he's absolutely 100% human. And I want to say to you, if you get your eyes fixed on him, you're going to get disappointed. He'll let you down. You keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And you give thanks for the human instruments that God places along our paths. Let's pray together.